Hi and welcome. We are going to be talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, I've been hinting at it for the last couple of weeks, but this week we're actually going to be talking about Chinese immigration and the Chinese Exclusion Act and its importance. This is a vitally important uh, act that um, is often overlooked or briefly described in most history classes, but we're going to take an in-depth look at it because its ramifications and the fight against the Chinese Exclusion Act um, has repercussions not only for African Americans, but Native Americans and other immigrants. As, um, well, Native Americans aren't immigrants, but immigrants in general as well. Uh, and uh, it, it really is uh, the only law of the time that specifically singles out a group um, that are considered so anti-American that they cannot be allowed in the country by name. Um, as it is the Chinese Exclusionary uh, Exclusion Act. This act was enacted on May 6, 1882 and signed into law by President, uh, a, um, President Arthur. And it, it remains in effect until 1943, after which um, it is formally removed, but the, uh, the, allot, the quota for the Chinese immigrants are, are ridiculously low. And that remains in effect until 1965. Um, post 1965 uh, is a direct result. The immigration laws that we have are a direct result of the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, particularly with quotas um, uh, from other countries of how many people we let in. And this all goes back to the Chinese Exclusion Act. So this is what we're going to be talking about this in lecture and. Um, Hopefully you'll have a more in-depth look on uh, the struggles of Chinese immigrants into the United States. Now, as I said before, this act, um, we're going to have to go back a little ways. Um, we talked a little bit about the experience of Chinese uh, Americans um, and Chinese immigrants with the Transcontinental Railroad. But just to have a little bit of understanding um, of of kind of how Chinese immigration developed, I'm going to give you a really brief history. So just to understand, in the U.S. Census in 1840, um, said that there were, uh, um, said there were, sorry, 14 million 195,695 free whites. There were 2 million 487, uh, sorry, 2 million 487,455 slaves. There were 386,303 uh, free color people. Uh, Native Americans were not included in the study. And there were four Chinese, uh, um, uh, Chinese people within the U.S. Census from 1840. Um, and 1848, James Polk, who was the president at the time, reported telling um, people to go develop the West. And he said, why don't we look at Chinese labor and create a Chinese colony to do this? Um, and this is before the discovery of gold with the gold rush. However, um, the U.S. and Britain wanted to trade with China, but they didn't have a lot to give them. Uh, they wanted silks and porcelain and tea and spices. Um, but the Chinese didn't want a lot of our um, our exported goods because they didn't need it. Um, and so what ends up happening is that uh, the uh, that Britain and America participated in this and they began um, giving opium into China and pretty much getting their citizens hooked on opium, controlling the market, and even though it was against Chinese law and they ended up reinforcing this. And so you have actually two opium wars that happen. We don't get to really talk about this, but this is in 1842 is the first one. And this results with the Treaty of Nanking um, and opens kind of ports of trades. Well, a trade that happens in the 1840s. On top of that, in the Qing Dynasty was kind of falling apart. And what results of this is the Taipei Rebellion in 1850. And this Taipei Rebellion had over 30 million people that who were slaughtered in on this. So at the same time, so this is in 1850, 1848, 49 gold is discovered in the United States and it is reached over and China is becomes aware of this. And so even though it's illegal to immigrate um, from or to um, uh, to leave China at the time, uh, people end up sneaking away and immigrating to the United States for the gold rush. There was a lot of people going through the gold rush um, all this time. Well, 
as I said, the Chinese come over, um, they begin working um, gold claims. They also open laundries in um, San Francisco. And it is, it is uh, said by census that by 1850, um, 4,000 Chinese had entered San Francisco, but by 1852, 10,000 had entered China. Um, again, it was illegal at this time for the Chinese to immigrate, so they kind of sneak away um, uh, from coastal cities to go over. Now, in, by 1852, in San Francisco, there were 20 uh, Chinese shops. And um, in 1850, by 1852, at the same time, um, white uh, um, Americans uh, began driving out foreign miners from the gold uh, from the gold fields, and they do this because there's not a lot of gold being found, and they want to have a monopoly on this, and so they remove um, as many people as possible, and they end up enacting laws to get these people to re removed. And one of these laws is anti-Chinese, and this says that um, Chinese uh, that there should not be any Chinese in any of these work camps, and uh, they can't own claims. On top of this, you have a lot of anti-Chinese uh, sentiment, like I said before, with the Transcontinental Railway. You have people, uh, you have the Chinese who are abused and killed. They're also trying to be driven off these claims. Their cues are cut, their long ponytails. Um, and this is partially because in 1852, John Bigler was elected governor of California and he ends up putting a heavy tax on the Chinese and they end up paying it anyway. He also starts spreading the rumor that the Chinese are coolies and that, um, that's C-O-O-L-I-E-S. And coolies, um, is, uh, is the term used for a Chinese serf, a Chinese slave. And so he was saying that with all the mass immigration of the Chinese coming over, that they are doing this in slave ships, um, instead of immigrants. And so he kind of starts spreading these rumors on top of that. He begins to pass, he passes a foreign miners tax and it, uh, specifically targets the anti-Chinese and the Chinese end up paying all these um, taxes at the same time they they work in a lot of these bad fields and eventually they go work for the Transcontinental Railway. Just to understand, in 1861 there are 35,000 Chinese immigrants in the United States. Well, in June 1861, Lincoln um, hearing Lincoln trying to um, make a. a a client, um, trying to have better relations with China, trying to have diplomatic ties. So he ends up sending um, the first Chinese ambassador over and his name's Anson Burlingame. And that's B-U-R-I, sorry, B-U-R-L-I-N-G-A-M-E. Um, and he sends them to the Beijing to kind of repair diplomatic ties after the Opium War. And one of the things that Bur uh, Burlingame does is he enacts a treaty. And with this treaty, he allows free flow of people between China and the United States. He allows this, uh, he gets this so that it's free passage. Now this is uh, at the time very critical lean because they need laborers in the West, even though they don't want the laborers in the West, as well as they want to have good relations with China to have cheaper trade during the Civil War. Um, with the Pacific Railway Act, um, uh, it's often referred to as uh, the Transcontinental Railroad is often referred to at the time as the Iron Road to China to allow better trade. And so as we had discussed, there's um, a lot of Chinese Im immigrants uh, that are um, are used in the workforce for the Transcontinental Railway. And there's a huge flux in, in population at this time. Um, and so while this is going on, while this transcontinental railway, as we had discussed with Reconstruction, the 14th Amendment was adopted and passed prior to Burlingame Treaty. And it said that all citizens born or naturalized citizens of the United States. However, there's this big fear of this coolie trade. Now, post-Civil War, one of the suggestions was that um, it, uh, in the South was, okay, we no longer have slaves. Why don't we actually take all these coolies um, and take these Chinese laborers who are going to work cheaply and use that as a replacement to plantation or to slavery and plantation. Now this was greatly feared, um, and it was uh, it was 
there was mass uh, protests, particularly in the Northeast and on trade unions about how this is just another way of slavery and they can't do this. So they end up having a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment, even though the Chinese had nothing to do with this, uh, this thought. And post uh, the Transcontinental Railway um, system, what ends up happening is that you have um, a large influx of Chinese immigrants who are working on the railway, who are no longer working for the railway, what are they going to do? So there's a lot of animosity. Um, some of them go work in factories in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. And there's a lot of propaganda at this time saying that these Chinese um, are working for a dollar a day and they're doing these incredible cheap labor um, that would have been uh, really underpaid. Um, but there's a lot of this propaganda that appears in newspapers and these unions begin to protest Chinese labor as a way of undermining them. So a lot of the scabs for the factory workers, the people who go and work while a strike is going on, happened to be Chinese immigrants who had gone to Pennsylvania and Massachusetts because they would work. And so a lot more anti-Chinese sentiment was coming from the West that was already heavily indoctrinated into anti-Chinese to the East Coast at this period. And one of the things that kind of escalates the tension is on October 24th, 1871. There is, um, what ends up happening is a white man is killed in the crossfire between two Chinese men who were, um, who were fighting in um, LA, uh, in the LA Chinatown. And what ends up happening is that a huge mob of um, almost, I think they said 300 to 500 um, men and women uh, who are white and Hispanic descent come into the Chinatown. And uh, one of the largest lynching occurrences happened during this time. And in fact, one woman is lynched, uh, one child is lynched, and they are lynched on church steeples, on um, lamp posts, on anything they can find. And it results in 18, um, uh, and on top of this lynching, the Chinese begin to fight back. And so they, they go around, they start firing. Um, they get some guns and they begin to fire on, on this huge mob that is coming. So what the uh, mob also does is they take, uh, they cut holes into the roof of their wooden houses and lob f incendiary fire, um, fire bombs into these buildings and it ends up um, setting most of Chinatown on fire. With that, 18 or between 18 to 20 uh, Chinese are... Um, are lynched. You also have about 18 of them that are burned alive, which is a pretty small number, but there are a lot more wounded as well. And this um, ends up coming into the East Coast papers as they said that Los Angeles is now the blood-stained Eden because it had always been saying uh, there was a lot of, oh, well, there's uh, more jobs in California and everything. So Los Angeles ends up getting increasing uh, a lot of problems that happen. What happens to the people who did the killings of the mob? Nothing. Um, there are 18 people who are convicted, or sorry, are um, accused, but later acquitted in the court systems because no one will testify against it. Everyone is very quiet about what happens. Some of it was the fear of what happens if you retaliate on your neighbor. So nothing happens as a result from this. And at this time, with this escalation, lawmakers in California begin to lobby for an exclusion law. Um, an exclusionary law that is going to um, uh, get the Chinese out. Okay, and so what ends up happening is that they end up getting a lot of Democrats um, to get on board with Chinese exclusion. And the reason is behind it, they wanted the... Um, the Democrats agree to get on um, board with Chinese exclusion in exchange for uh, overlooking a lot of the black code laws as well as a lot of the um, uh, Jim Crow laws that come about later. So they're saying, if you overlook this, we will get on board with helping you on the West Coast get rid of the Chinese. 
1875, Congress passes the Page Act. Now, the Page Act prohibits the immigration of people, of Chinese people who are coming under contracts to work because it's seen as contractual uh, serfdom that is happening. They also outlaw any prostitutes from coming in um, to the United States. Now, this is really important. This sounds like, okay, well, we don't want prostitutes. Well, there was a belief that all Chinese women, and this was propagated in newspapers as well as it was kind of a common stereotype that Chinese women were prostitutes. And so Chinese women to come into the country, if they decided to come, they had to prove that A, they were never a prostitute in China. They were not going to go into the business of prostitution in the United States. And they plan to never go into prostitution in the future. So it's, it's kind of like um, promising something that you might not have. So women, Chinese women had to endure, if they were coming to the United States, very few end up coming during this period because they were, they had physical exams, they were intimidated, they had to swear on oaths. It didn't matter if they were married or anything. It was viewed that they were going to be prostitutes. And so it pretty much um, negates female immigration at the time. And so there was a belief that if we can get rid of the female Chinese from coming, that Chinese men will stop coming as well. 